On the 14th of February 2021, I uploaded a video called SpaceX Busted. The video was mostly critical of the lack of progress of both SpaceX and Elon Musk in comparison to their uh, aspirational goals. A week or so later, on the 22nd of February, I made uh, sufficiently annoyed by the many demonstrably false claims of Elon Musk fans, I made a second video entitled SpaceX Busted Part 2. This video was significantly different in tone from the first and spent about half of the time on the demonstrable stupidity of many Elon Musk fans. Now allow me to give you a quick flavor of this 24 minute video. Firstly, I want to start this video with a sincere apology. In my previous video, I compared the space shuttle launch costs to the launch costs that SpaceX had contracted with NASA for. And as many, many Musk fans pointed out, I didn't adjust the space shuttle launch costs for inflation. This was clearly a serious error on my part that completely changes the conclusion. And I want to deeply apologize to anyone who might be misled by this. This serious lapse is no doubt the reason that the video got such a poor rating. I have no excuse for this. Nah, <laughs> those were the inflation adjusted launch costs, you muppets. But spoilers, if you have to invent alternative facts because it challenges what you believe to be true, you, sir, are every con man's wet dream. Today, we're going to take a look at the Dunning-Kruger Pride Parade that is your average Musk fan's defense of SpaceX. But curiously, there weren't hordes of SpaceX fans complaining how unfair and disingenuous I was by not increasing the uh, SpaceX numbers to be in 2012 dollars for a fair comparison. If you're haggling over whether he's actually made it 10% or 20% cheaper, as loads thought it really important to do with some sort of knockdown argument. Congratulations, you've just agreed that Musk hasn't done anything revolutionary. Yeah, there's a reason why Elon Musk fans got voted the most annoying on the internet. With a track record like that, it's stunning that anyone would defend him at all, let alone there to be an army of people who will vigorously defend him. But I suspect that facts don't greatly matter to these people. Here is a typical exchange. If you torch the data long enough, it will confess anything. The bias is real with this one. And the main utter fail, he ignored inflation. You serious? That's a facepalm. I assumed that correction could be assumed from him. My God, this is embarrassing. Yeah, it certainly is, Cassia. Meanwhile, some 20 years later, in Texas. Right on target, it's looking fantastic. Ignition number one, ignition number two, there's the flip. Yeah, there's the flip. Yes! Oh, uh -oh. God. Oh, God, no, no. Oh, <laughs> oh that was... Oh, my God. Yeah, it's interesting to have people excited about it, I guess. The video clip was to show the objective lack of awareness of the people who are such devoted fans of Elon Musk that they go to his launches, some of them professionally, and cheer like idiots when Elon Musk fails to do something that was achieved over 20 years ago. It's a clear theme throughout the video. And this is just another example of the criticism of the lack of awareness of Elon Musk fans. A few days later, I got an email from someone claiming that I had used their work which constituted some 15 odd seconds of the total timeline and maybe 18 if you included the dislocated audio and video. The portion of the video that he's actually claiming is the part where the rocket crashed where the people laughed like idiots. He claimed that he would normally charge $750 for this. This price immediately threw up all sorts of red flags as no one would pay this for a 15 second clip on YouTube. This was the first time in 15 years on YouTube that I had ever received a demand like this. And it is very difficult to come up with a charitable reading of the demand letter, which very quickly transitioned into legal threats and trying to amplify fear, uncertainty, and doubt. 
My immediate response was this video fell under fair use. Indeed, the American Bar Association has fair use listed as the doctrine that is used to encourage criticism and commentary of copyrighted works. It is based on the concept that one should be free to use portions of a copyrighted material without asking the permission of the copyright owner. This seems to be a fairly good faith description of my use of the work. He wrote back to me telling me how expensive it would get for me and that he had passed it on to a lawyer. I responded telling him that I would make a video about this, giving him about six hours, the time it would take me to make the video. The purpose of this was to allow him time to de-escalate whilst this was simply an email exchange and before any of it was made public. I received no reply, so I put the video up. Most of the video that I put up was constituted of merely reading the email exchange, followed by a quick, off-the-cuff rundown of the criteria of fair use. Trevor Mulman's response on Twitter was rapid. He called for me to be banned from YouTube and falsely claimed that I'd sent people to harass him. It is demonstrable that Trevor could not have come to the conclusion by actually watching the video I put up as he stated that he had not watched the video. Specifically, he says, I chose not to waste my time watching. Yeah, by the simple act of not watching a video, he had concluded that my livelihood on YouTube should be removed. Trevor sent me these tweets, directly naming me on them, then blocked me. This meant that by the time I actually got them, I had never actually sent anything to Trevor on Twitter. Nor would he be able to see them if I made them in any event, because you cannot see someone's tweets, because Trevor wouldn't be able to see my tweets once he'd blocked me. Shortly afterwards, in my spam folder, I found an email from his lawyer called Settlement Discussion. The offer was $1,500, and to maybe not talk about it publicly, I'm not entirely certain about the wording. I view this matter as of wide public concern on YouTube. Maybe more so, as there are very few cases where one public YouTuber requests $750 with legal threats from another simply to criticize one of their public videos on YouTube. Secondly, as Trevor had made these accusations publicly, a right to reply publicly seems reasonable. So I made this video. Trevor Malman's lawyers gave me a four-factor analysis where he claimed that my, my use of the video did not fall under fair use. He also asked me for my analysis of the four-factor, and this is it. I had, by this time, at a week or so later, made real attempts to get a lawyer to represent me on this, uh, but such things take time. So in order to move things along and see if we can actually come to a reasonable conclusion more quickly, I, I decided to give my own opinion on this. Factor one. Regardless of the commercial and non-commercial distinction, however, the first fair use factor weighs against a finding of fair use because your use of the video was not transformative. I disagree. I think it was very transformative. The question of transformative use has become central to the first factor and requires the end user add something new with a further purpose or different character altering the first with new expression, meaning, or message, regardless of whether its use is commercial. The kind of transformative use can be seen in the examples you provided to Mr. Malman in the Akila Hughes and Matt Hoss matters. Well, compared to the transformations in the Akila Hughes video, the ones presented here are massive. In that with the Akila Hughes video, um, Sargon of Akkad had just taken her entire video, made a few edits in there, and changed the title to something derogatory. And that counted as fair use to the point where it was thrown out at the very first level because the people who bought the case had not considered that this work was transformative in this manner. There, the end-user YouTubers discussed the aspect of the video specifically. Well, as do I. Commenting on it, as do I. And providing additional meaning and expression to the underlying video. Well, as do I. The new purpose and character of this work is to criticize SpaceX fans, something that is wholly missing from Trevor's original work, specifically criticizing 
directed by Trevor Marlman and his companions at the SpaceX launch for cheering like idiots at a failure, like it was a great success. In my video, this comes across as the clearly sarcastic statement, Yeah, it's interesting to have people excited about it, I guess. The comment is clearly sarcastic that these SpaceX fans are getting excited about failure, and this hardly represents objectivity. I should stress that this theme of criticizing Elon Musk fans was not a subtle or hard to miss element of the original video. But I suspect that facts don't greatly matter to these people. The resulting works were meant solely to provide additional commentary on the underlying video. Like I was saying, the lack of objectivity of people like Trevor Mulman and his fellow watchers at the SpaceX launch, giving the original work new meaning or message. Well, I did give it new meaning or message because the original work had no criticism of SpaceX fans in it. This is not the case here. I disagree. Where you used Mr. Malman's video exactly as it would have been licensed to you in the first place. Well, that doesn't actually make a lot of sense in that both of these earlier cases, which you stated were fair use, also used the video footage exactly as it would have been used if it had been licensed to them in the first place. But both of these ended up with successful defenses under fair use. The thing that makes the difference here is that critical comment has been added. And in this case, it has. In simple terms, if you're pointing a video camera at an explosion and acting like an idiot, people still have the right to criticize you for acting like an idiot. Exactly as it would have been licensed to in the first place to illustrate and show the dramatic crash of the SpaceX, SpaceX Starship SN9. You think that the work mainly shows the dramatic crash of the Starship SN9 and my work mostly shows the lack of objectivity of SpaceX rocket watchers like Trevor Malman and his companions. Clearly transformative. Another way to look at it is you could have easily used the same footage of the crash provided by SpaceX without any change to your video. This is just objectively wrong. So let's see, there are no SpaceX fans in this video to criticize, so this falls at the first hurdle. But it's more than that. There are no SpaceX fans who have taken the action of being so devoted to this stuff that they're willing to go and film it. Again, an action that can be criticized. We're talking about the sort of fans who think that this might end up getting us to Mars sometime soon. But it's more than just there aren't SpaceX fans in this video. There aren't SpaceX fans acting like idiots in this video. This absolutely could not have fulfilled the same role. The lawyer is simply wrong on every aspect when he says I could have used the SpaceX video and had no change to the purpose and meaning of my criticism of this work. Another way of looking at it is you could have easily used the same footage of the crash provided by SpaceX without any change to your video, but instead you chose to take Mr. Malman's without asking. SpaceX's footage would have illustrated your point just as well. Ultimately, this is not a parody or a commentary on Mr. Malman's video. It is a non-transformative illustration of the Starship SN9 crash, at which point I really have to ask, did he even watch my video? The purpose of the SpaceX busted video part two is equally criticizing SpaceX and SpaceX fans. It is absolutely impossible to watch this video and not come away with this message. The clip used is not used for the purpose of showing the rocket blowing up. As you state, the SpaceX video could have done that just fine. It's to show the idiot fans cheering, to show the author cheering at a rocket blowing up. Cheering at rockets blowing up and thinking it progress is like cheering at the Titanic sinking and think it's progress towards unsinkable ships. Beyond the criticism of the author cheering, the video also makes comment by directly comparing the landing with the DCX, 
the success of the uh, DCX landing with a stoic cameraman versus the idiots filming the SpaceX launch cheering as a flying dustbin crashes. Put simply, if the guy streaming a failure is an idiot, he doesn't gain a magical immunity from criticism simply by virtue of the fact that he happens to be pointing a camera at something interesting while he's doing it. So his conclusion of all of this is the first factor weighs against fair use. I completely disagree. I think that it actually is at least as strong in favor of fair use as the Akilah Hughes case. And that was such a weak case by Akilah Hughes that that got thrown out on a petition to dismiss. Now, this isn't just one point out of four. We're almost done at this point. The right to free expression, commentary and criticism is probably the most core element of the fair use provision. It outweighs almost everything else, as notably in the Akilah Hughes versus Carl Benjamin case. Carl Benjamin, he added nothing new to the actual footage. He added no audio commentary. He just made several edits to the video to juxtapose a few clips. And then he changed the title, and that counted as criticism. Carl Benjamin was doing it commercially. Uh, you could have argued that Carl Benjamin could have just used the audio, that his use wasn't minimalistic. Carl Benjamin didn't seek to purchase licenses for Achilles Hughes's work. You could argue that Carl Benjamin's work reduced the ability of Achilles Hughes to sell licenses and so forth. None of it greatly mattered, as it added criticism and commentary that just wasn't in the original. And here, my video clearly adds criticism and commentary that wasn't in the original. Marlman's video does not contain any criticism of SpaceX fans, especially those like himself who turn up to cheer at failure. Factor two, both you and Trevor say is in my favor, but doesn't matter much, so we'll take that and move on. Which brings us on to factor three. Here, even though only a small portion of Mr. Marman's video was taken, that part was the heart of the work, which is the most valuable and pertinent portion of the work at issue. But it's really not. I could not have used this clip if someone like Trevor Malman wasn't cheering at failure. I mean, it's almost a tautology that you think that it's just a video of a rocket blowing up, and I transform that into a criticism of the people like Trevor Malman watching the rocket blow up. The section is actually now blurred out on the video, not because it would make any difference to a legitimate copyright claim, but more as a good faith gesture to Malman, as it highlights the criticism of his work therein. And I've got to say, I think this detracts from the actual original work and highlights that I did indeed use the minimal amount of work needed to make the criticism. Not being able to see the rocket that Malman is reacting to is a distraction that highlights that I did use the minimum amount necessary. Malman has further argued on his Twitter feed, here, even though only a small portion of my video was used, that portion is the heart of the work, which is the most valuable and pertinent portion of Thunderfoot's video. That's just simply demonstrably wrong. But we'll come to that in a second. Without the crash, it would not bring Thunderfoot's video home. Again, I'm going to guess that you never actually watched the original video, the tone of which is set from the very start of the video, that facts really don't matter to an awful lot of SpaceX fans. With a track record like that, it's stunning that anyone would defend him at all, let alone there to be an army of people who will vigorously defend him. But I suspect that facts don't greatly matter to these people. A theme that runs throughout the video. Is he right in saying that this clip really brings this point home? Well, yeah, but probably not for the same reasons he thinks the heart of his work is valuable. He thinks that the valuable part of the work is rocket go boom. I think it's valuable because it has people in it who are sufficiently simplistic to go around chasing this stuff and rather simplistically laugh when the rocket goes boom. The second clearly is a different meaning from the first, and that's what makes this transformative. But in any event, 
The claim is demonstrably false. YouTube has analytics that allow you to track audience attention. And far from being something that gained attention, it turns out there was actually a spike in audience attention for the successful landing of the DCX. Meanwhile, there is a rapid decline after that for Trevor Marman's laughing at failure. And I should stress this screen capture was taken before I added the blur to YouTube. The fourth and final factor considers the effect of use upon the potential market or value of the copyrighted work. In addition to showing a direct impact on Mr. Marlin's market for his footage, specifically, courts are directed to examine whether unrestricted and widespread conduct of the sort engaged in by the defendant would result in a substantially adverse impact on the potential market value for the original and the market for derived works. In other words, if your kind of taking was allowed on a large scale, would there be a substantial impact on the market for Mr. Malman's work? If the answer is yes, Mr. Malman's market for licensing the video would be completely destroyed if YouTubers were simply allowed to take video they found and use them for this kind of illustrative uses without paying a license fee. No court would extend fair use to encompass any similar non-transformative use by a YouTuber. The fourth factor weighs against fair use. Well, the kind of activity I'm engaging in here is making fun of SpaceX fans, including Trevor Malman. So the core of point four is whether unrestricted making fun of Trevor Malman's reaction to rockets blowing up would impact his potential market. Well, honestly, it does seem rather unlikely that there's going to be a widespread activity like making fun of Trevor Malman's reactions to rockets blowing up. It seems kind of niche. But even if there were, it's exactly stuff like that that the fair use provision is meant to protect. Trevor Malman and the activities of Trevor Malman, you know, like how he responds to a rocket blowing up. And I really want to stress this on a public YouTube channel. Do not gain immunity from criticism via the copyright law simply because he's pointing a camera at something interesting. But maybe the best argument that there really isn't a market for selling licenses like this on YouTube, and thus the market is actually going to be hard to damage if it doesn't actually exist. I mean, we're not talking about, you know, for just people who want to criticize Malman, not that you would need a license for that, but, you know, if you wanted to buy his footage just to watch the spaceships go boom, the best argument why a market for that doesn't actually exist is actually made by Trevor Malman's own lawyer. His lawyer states that the bit that he thinks is the most valuable portion of the work, the uh, heart of the work, he says, could be replicated by the SpaceX video. It would show all of the critical things that Marman's video does, but without the $750 license. Yes. Trevor also makes the argument that I'm only asking for reasonable compensation as per my usual, and frankly very similar industry rates, for using my footage in the video. That's it. Ask anyone. ABC News, Russia Today, The Daily Mail, Petapixels, Thunderfoot, all of these respectable outlets have a similar rate to use footage for their productions. So you're charging YouTubers what you would ABC News? Well, I mean, it's not a copyright argument, but yeah, I think that might be a pretty tough sell to your fellow YouTubers when you say that reasonable compensation is asking a YouTuber for the same rate that you would charge to a major international news organization. Especially when all he wanted to do was criticize your reaction to a rocket blowing up. Especially when you're going to directly conclude that with, despite Phil's best efforts to make a big stir, I will not stoop to his pettiness and hate brigading. Uh, maybe I should remind you that you did start this um, mm, Twitter dialogue by saying that I should be banned from YouTube. Well, that concludes my four-factor analysis that Trevor Marman's lawyer requested. I find his analysis in error and that the work is covered by the affirmative defense of fair use under all four points, but most importantly, in the aspect of fair use for the purpose of criticism and commentary. The reality here is I have a good faith understanding that my work falls within fair use. 
Admittedly, this is a layman's understanding. And if necessary, I can get real lawyers to do this properly. But like I was saying, I wanted to move this along quickly. Sadly, however, if they do decide to move forward with this, this will probably drag on for over a year. And regrettably, I might have to ask for your support with that at some point. But you have seen Trevor's lawyer's argument as to why this is not fair use and that they think a suitable settlement is one and a half thousand dollars and mine where it is covered by fair use. And if you agree with my analysis that this is fair use, then this sort of thing needs to be defended. This sort of stuff matters on YouTube and it matters for those who create works through criticism and commentary.